great to see you all here this morning. Um, this is the sermon that I'm preaching today is the third and final part of a mini series called The Power of Assembly, where we've been just um, thinking together about the importance of assembling and the different ways that uh, we can gather and the things we've learnt um, over lockdown about the wonders of internet ministry and as in many aspects of our life, business life, uh, friendship, family, education, uh, we are hopefully coming out of lockdown into some freedom. It's time for us to think at every level of our life the importance of the internet and Zoom and Skype and things like that, but also re-emphasizing the importance of physical gathering. And uh, today, of course, there's a, a very important gathering taking place at Wembley, where uh, it's amazing how um, more and more people have been allowed to meet in Wembley as time goes on, isn't it? You know, government knows what they're doing, don't they? And uh, so there at Wembley, the final, obviously, this evening, and um, it was 1966, the last time that England won a major tournament. And uh, you think that's a long time ago. And I spoke to my dad, what were you doing? And he said he was uh, actually on a plane to Jordan doing some work, so he missed it. And uh, I was speaking to my father-in-law, and I was saying, you know, it must have been wonderful to watch it on television, the 1966 World Cup. And he said to me, I was there. I said, you were there? Yeah, I was in the crowd. And I said, that must have been incredible. And we spoke about what it, what it was like to be in that stadium, that, that famous event in 1966. What I'm saying is, there's one thing to watch things on television, but there's another thing to be there at the scene, in person, isn't there? If, if you like um, classical concerts, or if you have a favorite pop group, you know you can enjoy the albums and the DVDs and uh, watch the videos and YouTube, but if you've ever been to, to your favorite artist's live performance there in person, you know it's a, a totally different thing. And these are the sort of things that we're thinking about right across the span of our, our lives, but also when it comes to church. And as you uh, heard, we have a single event coming up. We've got a new singles ministry uh, called Emmanuel Connect. And what this is doing is it, it's there to facilitate singles increasing their social networking with singles of other churches. And it's for singles of all ages, not just young adults, but also those that are retired or perhaps widowed of all ages. And we'll be doing different events. And um, again, it just, just so that singles can, can meet other singles from other, other churches. And if you want more details, go to our ministry page and it'll talk about how the singles will be meeting um, down in Victoria Food Court uh, and you can sign, sign up for that. Of course, next Monday is, we hope, Freedom Day. And so we have one final Sunday uh, in the sense as we are doing it and then hopefully the next Sunday will be very different and as you've heard we're going to be having a uh, very nice coffee and cake in the morning for people that want to turn up early and fellowship uh, also after the services from a week on Sunday God willing as long as Freedom Day takes place, we'll be opening up our um, upper hall um, where we'll have tables out and you'll be able to bring food and fellowship. Uh, week on Sunday, we have a special worship Holy Spirit service, as you've heard, from two o'clock to four o'clock, which will allow us just to praise God and worship God uh, unhurried, uh, without restrictions, able to move around, able to sing, able to wait on the Lord, and we're, we're believing God for a, a prophetic touch to that worship service on the first Sunday um, after Freedom Day. And there's other things that will be happening. For example, um, if you look on our website, we haven't announced it today, but the first three Sunday afternoons in August from 2 o'clock to 3.45, we're going to be having our Emmanuel School of Ministry Summer School. So in the first three Sundays of August, I'm going to be teaching on the subject, Does God Work All Things for Good? 
does God work all things for good? When we look at the pandemic and we think of what's happening in the world and even in our lives, does God really work all things for good? That's going to be our Emmanuel School of Ministry summer school, Sunday afternoons in August. But today we're going to uh, complete our series on uh, the power of assembly. And then for the rest of uh, July, preachers are going to bring their own sermons, what they feel the Lord has laid on their heart for you. And then when we move into August, August we're going to be ministering on the topic of soul care. Soul care. A lot of people have been through a lot of things in the last year or so. Uh, sometimes it's been good and sometimes it's been challenging and difficult. So throughout August, we're going to be bringing a series of messages to bring healing and wholeness and shalom to your heart and your mind and maybe your body if the Holy Spirit moves in healing. A place where we can just, in August, renew ourselves and strengthen ourselves and deal with any pains or hurts or things that have, have, have got into our life uh, over, over the past and just come out into the autumn refreshed, healed, whole and strong. So that's going to be ministry of the soul in August. Well today I want to speak on the topic of in the presence of God and one another. In the presence of God and one another. If that phrase sounds uh, slightly familiar to you. It's because you've probably heard it at a wedding. It's uh, my favorite bit of, bit of the wedding where you just get to the place where the vows have been exchanged, the rings have been exchanged, and then as the couple turn to face the congregation, uh, the preacher makes the pronouncement that they're man, of what, man and wife, and you begin it by saying, in the presence of God and in one another, when, well, you don't begin it, but you end it, in the presence of God and one another, I now pronounce this man and this, this man, oh, I've forgotten already. I usually have it written down. I now pronounce you man and wife. But notice that declaration is in the presence of God, but also in the presence of one another. And often we as uh, evangelical Christians, we often think about the presence of God. We heard a song yesterday, a song earlier on today, talking about the atmosphere is changing, which is a prophetic song. We hope that it does. And the idea being is that when the presence of God manifests itself, things begin to happen. When the Holy Spirit turns up when during worship or prayer or preaching or life groups we begin to feel that something is different God is here God is turning up God is everywhere all of the time but God can turn up can manifest can show himself and we are seeking the presence of God and so we talk a lot about and sing a lot and pray a lot about the presence of God and rightly so because when God turns up he brings with him his power, his purity, his blessing, his voice and his direction in the presence of God. But what about in the presence of one another? We don't have as many songs or many prayers about being in one another's presence. But for a long time, uh, we, we haven't been in one another's presence. We haven't been in the presence of good friends and, and some family members very often. And uh, we, we felt that lack of, 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 not the lack of the presence of God, but we have felt the lack of the presence of one another. And, and perhaps that's because both are important in the church. The presence of God and the presence of one another. So we're going to look at this. I'm going to read a passage from Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 1 to 4, then directly to Acts 2, verse 42. And in this passage, as I read, think about the people physically gathering, the fellowship, the together. Think about them together and what happened, the presence of God and the presence of one another. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together. In the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in these two passages, we do see the presence of God and the presence of one another. Here in the upper room, um, the church had, had dwindled to just over a hundred people. And there they were, but those that still gathered, uh, th those, those 130, 120 people that gathered together, they didn't forsake gathering. And when they were all together in one place, they had the presence of one another, and then the presence of God came very powerfully to a specific people in a specific place. It was the upper room, not the lower room. Those who were on the ground floor didn't get what those on the upper floor got. It's amazing how, at times, God can send his spirit to a specific people in a very specific place. Now, of course, the presence of God didn't stay in the upper room. Those that were in the upper room took that presence out with them. And very soon, 3,000 people got saved that day. And the presence of God moved from house to house in the temple courts as uh, people met and witnessed and evangelized. But there is something to say that the, those that were in that upper room received something that day that others didn't. I wonder if later some people thought, wow, this is amazing. Oh, I knew I should have gone to that prayer meeting. I, I knew that was the night I shouldn't have watched Netflix. I thought about going, but I didn't. Well, there was other opportunities to receive God's presence, of course. But there's a point here. And then we see in the next passage that they were gathering. They were together. They had fellowship in different places, in their homes and in the temple courts, which would uh, have thousands of people at that revival time listening to the preaching of the apostles. And it wasn't just that they were in the presence of one another, but they were also receiving outpourings of the presence of God with incredible miracles and signs that God was performing in the presence of God and in one another. Now, as we move out of, of, of lockdown, um, we are going to enjoy the best of both worlds. We as a church have learnt many things about the internet and the blessings of internet, being able to meet with people we wouldn't normally meet with and, and do things that we wouldn't normally do for the blessings of internet. In fact, the fact that we haven't been able to gather as, as we normally did in the past has been a blessing as we have learnt to multiply the ways that we can gather together. Uh, I became the leader of the New, T New Kingston Cell Group, Life Group, and began to meet people who live very far away from me, me living in Buckinghamshire. After a while, some people joined the church and joined our Life Group, which is online every Friday evening. And uh, now that lockdown's ended, well, there's no way that we can meet physically on a Friday evening. I can't travel to Kingston. Kingston can't travel to me. Other people have joined from other parts of London. Uh, they won't be able to travel. So we are continuing to enjoy our online life group. And we're really pleased about it because we've forged strong friendships and relationships over the time. So we have got something 
from Zoom that we wouldn't have had if we'd never had it. I would never have been able to look after the new Kingston uh, life group. How could I possibly have done? So God has done something very special through that. We'll continue to do it. The same with our Tuesday evening Holy Spirit meeting. We used to gather here, but only a relative few could come here on a Tuesday evening. But now we, we have people from all over London and from our Edgware church that gather for that time of listening to the Holy Spirit's word and prophetic teaching. We're going to continue to do that. So what I'm talking about today, I understand, will be applied in different ways. And also, people move at their own pace of grace. Some were right back in the pews as soon as the doors opened on at the church. Others, for various reasons, health reasons or other reasons, will go, move at a slower place, pace coming back to physical gathering. And you know what? That's all right. We're going to keep our Zoom and YouTube going. It's okay for people to move at different paces for different reasons, as long as it's not only just convenience, but there's also an element of conviction as well. But we certainly don't want there to be the feeling of compulsion. So convenience is fine, but not when it overtakes conviction, but neither do we want to feel compulsion because the Holy Spirit does not compulse people. He's a gentleman. But having said that, we are talking about gathering so that we can think through different issues. And, it's, and as we saw here, God does sometimes visit powerfully people gathered in certain places. In the Old Testament, we see that God visits people in particular places. And often when God visits the people of God in the Old Testament or individuals where there's a great manifestation of his presence, a victory against the enemy, or perhaps the place like Bethel where Jacob sees a ladder with angels going up and down from heaven, or, or, or wherever God meets them, often they would mark the place. They would say, God came to us or me at a specific time in a specific place and we're going to build an altar here so whoever comes across this place they'll stop and they'll remember this is where it's happened to this particular person and we're not saying that we should build shrines whenever God turns up we know that God is everywhere all of the time and as Stephen preached in Acts, God does not dwell in temples uh, made of stone. We understand that. We understand God is wherever his people are. But at the same time, we understand that also God does choose certain gatherings in certain places to show his spirit when he desires. The history of revivals when God really brings his presence in a city or a church or a, a nation is locational, locational. So God can visit a nation, God can visit a town, God can visit a community and in that particular place for a particular period, God's presence and the presence of people become wonderfully mingled and we need to be aware of that. I think of Azusa Street in Los Angeles, which was the beginning of the great Pentecostal outpouring of the 1900s, which is still flowing through the earth today. And where did it begin? In a tiny, wooden, ramshackled uh, gathering on Azusa Street. And the preacher, uh, William Seymour, had one eye missing, they, they were a small uh, ethnic group, nobody had ever heard of them, but God chose that place and those people to pour out his spirit, and out of that, the world is still being touched. Some of you in the 90s might have remembered a great visitation of God in a vineyard church in Toronto, Canada, right next to the airport. 
God was pouring out his love and his, uh, his acceptance and his healing and his power in this vineyard church right next to Toronto Airport. And people heard about this. God was doing something in a particular place through a particular people and people traveled all over the world. I went myself with a group and we traveled all the way to this place to meet with God and we did meet with God and we brought back something from that place to the place where we were. And so I say these things as a reminder that God does visit a group of people that gather together in a particular place. And although we don't build shrines to these places, I mean, some of these historical sites where God met his people in a particular place at a particular time were very interesting historically to visit, but actually God, God is no longer there in that sense. That, that period has passed, that time has, has, has gone. And so we don't, we don't make shrines, we don't become superstitious, but we do recognize that these are important events and our, one of our prayer lines at Emmanuel is that not only will God move in our life groups and our personal lives and our friendships and online but we do believe that this building has some part to play perhaps in the destiny that God has for us as a city church based in Westminster, that perhaps God will use this building and gather people here to his glory. It's not about a building, but perhaps God has plans, and that's one strand amongst other strands in our thinking and, and praying. Now, I've spoken a bit about the presence of God, but what about the presence of one another? Well, I've been thinking about the New Testament and um, how Paul uh, communicated with people. And I believe that Paul, um, if he could, he liked to be physically present in meetings. That, that was his priority, if he could be with people, because he understood that personal presence is different than all f other forms of communication, although all other forms of commu communication have been given us to utilize. So here, here's a few scriptures. I make a few comments um, on them. 1 Timothy 3.14, 3, uh, Paul speaking or writing in his letter to Timothy and the church. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing to you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. So here we see that Paul is saying, look, I really would like to be with you, to stay with you to be in your presence, to be face to face, to lay hands upon you and bless you and pray for you and, and have conversations with you and break the same bread with you. That's what I want to do and that, that's what my hope is and I want to come soon, it's in my plans, but it just can't happen at this precise moment. It's not practical and rather than, than delay, I'm using the, this, this form of communication, this letter, to convey things I want to express to you. And Paul used letters, and we're very grateful today that Paul did write letters, not just communicate in person, because those letters have become scripture, and you know, we're preaching from them today. So all forms of com communication have their place. The internet, the email, WhatsApp, face-to-face, -face, all communications have their place and we should use them all because if we don't use them all, we're going to miss out on some communication, some uh, uh, connection with other people that, um, that, that we wouldn't have if we didn't have this communication. So Paul would send letters because he couldn't get there at that time himself. Or he would also send ambassadors, wouldn't he? 
he would send somebody on his team and say, look, I can't go there right now because I'm limited. I'm only one person. So take a letter, but also I want you, Timothy, or Barnabas, or whoever it might be, Mark, I want you to go in my place and communicate what you've heard in my presence, communicate to them until I can find the time to be there themselves. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this so that we can come out of lockdown with our eyes open and um, understand in our workplaces, our family scenarios, um, everything, our recreation, our church, that we can be aware and we can think we're not going up just one or another form of communication, but we want to use all forms of communication to the glory of God, to build relationships, and to build the kingdom of God. All of them. But not all are the same, so we also have to think, what is appropriate? What is appropriate? And not just think about what's convenient, or that is one element, not just think what is convenient, but what is best for the particular thing that the Lord wants to do in this relationship. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 4, he says, recalling your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Isn't that beautiful? Paul is remembering the last time that he was in the presence of these people. He remembered he could physically, you can't physically see someone's tears when you're just writing letters, but he remembered the face. He remembered the tears uh, uh, rolling down their faces. He remembered that moment of face-to-face -face communication. Is there somebody that you haven't seen face-to-face -face physically since lockdown? Somebody you haven't seen that's dear to you. Maybe a family member in a far-off land. Maybe a friend in a not-so-far-off land. Maybe in another city, but you haven't been able to see them physically because of what's been going on. You may have seen them on Skype. You may have seen them on Teams. You may have seen them on Zoom. You may have telephoned them. You may have texted them, WhatsApp them, and emailed them, but you haven't been in their physical presence during lockdown. Well, I know some of you that that is the case of. I know some of my fellow life members, uh, life group members who have family far off. And that's difficult. That's been difficult for you. That's been hard for you because there's something about being in someone's presence that cannot in any way be replaced by any form of communication and thank God for all the other forms of communication. And I know that some of you, as soon as you can, if you've got the money, you're going to buy that ticket. You're going to travel maybe thousands of miles or on a train up somewhere. You're going to travel thousands of miles. You're going to get on that plane and the anticipation is going to start. And you're going to come off that plane. Uh, you're going to come off that train. You're going to enter into that airport. You're going to come out and collect your luggage. And then you're going to see that person. And the joy and the hugs. You can't replace that with anything. You travel thousands of miles for that. So what am I saying? I'm saying that it's important for us as we come out of lockdown, not, not, not to just stay where we are when we couldn't gather. I know people will move at different paces of grace and some will come back earlier than others for, for valid reasons. That's okay. We're not compulsing. We're not pushing you. We're asking you to think about the beauty of different forms of gatherings and communication. That's, that's all we're doing so that we can appreciate what we hope is coming back into our lives. And as we at different paces embrace the gatherings, that it'll be all the more sweeter, perhaps through this series, because we'll have thought through the issues. Romans 1 verse 8, 13 uh, is another scripture about how, um, we'll go straight to verse 11 in the second paragraph, how Paul longs to go to Rome. He says, I long 
to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. And he talks about, I planned many times to come, but I've been preventing, so I've been prevented to do so. He couldn't wait to be there because he couldn't wait to impart an anointing or a spiritual gift to the people in their presence. Uh, thank God for listening to preachers and worship on the internet. Uh, I love that. There's many preachers I like that I could never go and sit in their presence because they're not over here in England, but I, I get to listen to their teaching online. I can go back to preachers that are no longer around like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones or Dr. Derek Prince, and I can listen to their recordings. I love it. But as I said earlier, there is something about sitting in the presence of the word being preached face to face. There's something about being in a worship service, physically present, that is different, even though it's a blessing, to receiving it online. These things are God-ordained. And then finally, my final thought on this, not really adding much new, but just 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, 11. I want in this passage you to see how sometimes communication can only take place face to face or it becomes miscommunication. Paul speaking to, the, to Corinth, you're judging by appearances. If anyone is confident they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I'm not ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking accounts for nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we were present. Have you ever sent an, have you ever been annoyed and sent an email and then tried to recall it. You wish you hadn't sent it. Because when you're sitting at home or in the office and you're annoyed and the person has annoyed you, you write things that you wouldn't, you wouldn't say if you were sitting right opposite them. Their presence would be different. And there's nothing worse than writing something that was a bit too harsh, except trying to recall it and then it comes up on their email that you've tried to recall it, already showing that you wish you hadn't done it, and then, you know, the hole just gets bigger as you, as you dig it. And even on Skype or even on the telephone, it's very different. Sometimes, and here, here was some friction with Paul, sometimes the only way to communicate is face-to-face. -face. There's something about being face-to-face -face with some, somebody where you can see their expressions, you, you can feel that they're there. You are different when you meet someone face to face. And, and arguments that take place online or over emails, when you get the two people together, often there's an understanding that comes that only comes face to face, face to face. Now here Paul is using that negatively, but I'm saying there's a beautiful positive to this. Uh, if you have seen someone you haven't seen for a long time because of lockdown, isn't it wonderful? I know we've still got masks on. Just wait till we can see each other's smiles. But it, it's different. It's wonderful. So God works and we seek God's presence. And God's presence is what we want in the presence of God. But also these three Sundays have just been a reminder for us to remember with all the wonderful communication tools we've learnt and used so much and continue to use we remind ourselves that the church is always in the presence of God and in one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that it looks like by your grace, who knows, we never know what might happen, but Lord, that things are easing up. We pray that things will ease up, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that, that as we move forward at our different paces of grace, that we will avail ourselves of all the wonderful things we've learnt through communication 
that have extended your kingdom and increased fellowship opportunities. But also, Lord, as we hopefully begin to meet those that we haven't met for a long time, both at church, families, friends, colleagues, we pray, Lord, that you will bless those physical meetings and that in the coming days, we will appreciate more than perhaps we've ever done in our lives and be grateful, perhaps, more than ever done, we've done in our lives, not only to be in the presence of God, but one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.